As soon as I warmed the tires on my PS5 and slid Gran Turismo 7 into the engine bay, my gamer jiddly bit swelled with emotion and nostalgia. However, once my PS1 chub wore off, I started to notice muddy and blocky textures that look like a remastered PlayStation 3 title. I started peeling off my Gran Turismo merchandise when I noticed a ton of non-voice acted NPCs that are a bubble picture of someone you've never met and simply don't care about, and are going to end up spamming the cross button to skip through what they have to say. Then I picked up on the terrible money system, an awful balance of currency. You earn it slow, upgrades are unrealistic expensive, you can't sell duplicate cars, and the gambling system will rob you Ray Charles. That's blind. By not giving you much in-game money, it implores you to visit the real-world money store, where cars can be up to $40, in a game you already paid $70 for. This game has implemented fantastic use of the DualSense controller, and the cars generally do look pretty, but this game does not feel next generation. And I will point out so many missed opportunities that could have made this game seem like it's really on a PS5, and has been in development for five years with a practically unlimited budget as this is a first-party SIE or Sony Interactive Entertainment title. Oh yeah, this game is online only, by the way. So God forbid your internet goes down or the GT7 servers are taking a shit, which happened a lot during the first couple days, you're simply not playing this game. Also, Gran Turismo 7 launches with 425 cars. Gran Turismo 6 on the PlayStation 3 had 1,247. Granted, a lot of those cars didn't have animated interiors, and the overall attention to detail is far better in GT7. But still, 425? I'm gonna do something a lot of these game reviewers were simply unable to do with Gran Turismo 7 and that is to put their nostalgia on the back burner. I'm gonna cut the BS and call it just like it is. The final score for this game rhymes with AK-40 Kevin. Let's get it. Alrighty, Stallions and Stallionettes, welcome to the Gamer Heaven. I am your host, AK40 Kevin. So I'm going to break down this game review by categories such as graphics, audio design, soundtrack, gameplay, replayability, etc. However, I am going to structure this one slightly different by starting with a new category called Missed Opportunities, because in my opinion, that is what this game is all about. There were so many fantastic opportunities for this game to truly step forward the franchise. One big leap from the eighth generation of home consoles, the PlayStation 4, to the ninth generation of home consoles, the PlayStation 5. But at its core, this plays virtually identical to a PlayStation 2 or 3 Gran Turismo game. In 2022, on a $500 flagship console that's been out for over a year and a lot of gamers still can't get their hands on. Polyphony's being a big old polyphony, and Sony ain't backing up the pony. Now, first of all, this isn't a missed opportunity, but I do want to make a quick note or caveat that I have observed about the Gran Turismo series, and that is the fact that it falls into a very weird middle ground, where it's too casual for hardcore racing sims. You know, the kind of guys that play 30-hour endurance races with a catheter hooked up to a camelbacks so they can stay hydrated and not have to take a piss at the same time. The same guys that only talk to their wife and kids with the visor on their full face helmet pulled down. And instead of oven mitts, this guy's in the kitchen with full racing gauntlets. However, the game is a little bit too hardcore, tuning focused, and realistic in its driving nature for a lot of arcade casuals that are expecting to be able to hit a corner going 90 miles an hour and don't want to adjust things like shock dampening and rebound and just want to hold down the nitrous button and hit a jump over a mobile home park. So I've noticed the Gran Turismo series falls into a weird middle ground where guys that are into hardcore racing simulators are like, oh, it's too casual. You've only got 60 fields of adjustment when customizing your car as compared to a real racing sim, which got about 60,000. And then you've got the casuals that are like, why do I have to break before the corner? I should just be able to pin it in the corner full speed, full regalia, and not have to lay off the throttle. But the thing is, people like myself who have been playing the game for years, over a decade, find a lot of enjoyment because it is a racing simulator. In fact, it was the first real approachable racing simulator, and it definitely leans more towards the side, far further towards the side of being a racing simulator, not an arcadey game where the handling is just super twitchy. Missed opportunities. The game absolutely should have had fully animated NPCs or non-player characters. When you're in the cafe, which we are going to cover in a little bit, that is how the entire story unfolds, and how you are organizing races is by going through the menu at a coffee cafe that shows you, okay, we're going to get into the history of 70s Japanese sports cars here. Now we're going to talk about American muscle, blah, blah, blah. And it gives you a sweet little history lesson, and I did like that part. But the fact is, these NPCs should have been fully animated talking characters to you. Not only are they not that, it's not even voice acted. You get a little Google stock photo bubble of some random guy from a testimonial for a boner medication who you've never met before in any of the previous Gran Turismo titles, you know, that you have to sit there and read 17 paragraphs about the history of the Ford Mustang. And eventually it gets to the point where even if you are interested, you simply are not anymore because it's so goddamn dry and boring. You're going to sit there spamming the cross 
pause button trying to get into the next race. So that's a huge missed opportunity. Every time you are talking to an NPC that's giving you a brief about how to tune your car or how to earn the next license tier, which museum to look at rare cars, explaining to you how to bust out your camera and do the sweet photography mode, it's all just a stupid stock photo in a circle with paragraphs you have to read. Missed opportunity. Next up, the license center, which is mandatory for you to earn different license tiers to enter certain races, should have been a fully interactive experience where as you're driving, they are giving you live real-time advice like, hey, you're taking that corner a little bit wide. Why don't you try to do the out in out on this next corner or start breaking now. You're approaching the apex or something like that to actually help you learn how to be a better driver in Gran Turismo. Instead, all you get is again, one of these NPC bubbles with a brief paragraph explaining what the next test is about. And then you can watch a demonstration video, which isn't narrated or anything. I do think that the license center should have been a fully interactive experience where as you're doing something that is incorrect, they will correct you. So you can know, hey, you know what? I did cut that corner a little bit close. Or you know what? I braked too early. I didn't enter at the apex. I was driving too conservatively. I could have actually been more aggressive on the throttle coming out of that corner. Stuff like that. It would have made the license experience, which again is mandatory, much more enjoyable. Instead, it just feels like a tedious grind, which it kind of always has. Next up, you can preview your cars in your garage to get a little bit of an idea of what they look like on the outside or the inside. However, there should be a fully interactive tour like we've seen with Forza Motorsports, where you can walk around the car and open doors, pop the bonnet or hood, open up the boot or trunk, start flipping dials and switches on the infotainment system, turn the windshield wipers on to make it a little bit more realistic like you really do own this car in some kind of virtual garage. Since this game currently does not have VR support, which I think might be implemented later considering PSVR 2, which is specifically going to be for the PlayStation 5, is most likely going to take advantage of a lot of first party Sony interactive games. So I'm assuming GT would be one of these games. In the meantime, it would be nice if you had a more interactive experience when it comes to exploring your cars and actually checking them out. But that's cool. We'll keep it in the PlayStation 2 era. Now, I will say even though they do not have an interactive tour of the vehicles, they do have a fantastic photo mode to get some really awesome cinematic shots of your vehicles. Next up is a graphical gripe and ray tracing is only implemented during cutscenes, replays, and car previews, not during any of the live races in order to get a frame rate of 60 frames per second, which I totally understand. I generally will prioritize high frame rate over sheer graphical fidelity or the prettiest graphics. However, you should be given the option to target 30 frames per second and have constant ray tracing on, even if they had to taper back on some of the ray tracing effects. Next up, there is still in 2022, no crash animations or car damage whatsoever. You get a little bit of scrapes on your paint job, but your bumpers aren't dented in. You get no bent body panels or glass flying or anything. So you can literally stuff your vehicle going 220 miles an hour into a wall. And you're going to be like, Oop, ooh, got a little scrape on the paint. Makes this racing simulator seem a little bit less realistic. And going right along with that racing simulator theme, when you do take damage, you should have to repair it, pay in credits to take your car to a body shop and repair it, which would encourage you to drive cleaner and not brush up against vehicles and smack walls and go off track. And it would make it, well, simply more realistic as a simulator that if you damage your vehicle, you have to pay for it. Now in the endurance races, you still do have tire wear where you're going to need to pull into a pit. You make sure you get your brakes checked and change your tires, refuel, top her off with that uh, E85, that racing fuel and whatnot. There should be damage. There should be visible damage on the vehicles. So price and platform, this game is $60 on the PlayStation 4 and $70 on the PlayStation 5. During the performance section of this video, I will go over the differences between the PS4 and 5. Just know there is a substantial difference between the PS4 and 5 version. The PS5 loads about 10 times faster. Graphics look a lot sharper. All the immersive features of the DualSense controller and a bunch of other goodies. Well, the story is told through a cafe, basically. You're in a coffee cafe. You know, you got your favorite barista out there making a latte or a double macchiato for you. Maybe a cap little cappuccino. And you have these menus, which I really liked because instead of just jumping into random races, not really feeling like you have any direction, it tells you, hey, now we're going to look at the history of these particular cars and why they're in the game, why they're important. And it gives you a little history lesson on cars that you might not know anything about and might not even understand why they're in this racing game. Like, oh, the 1965 Mini Cooper will put one in her pooper. The 1975 BMW McBeamer nicknamed the Midnight Creamer. And it tells you all these cool little niche history facts about vehicles. And I really like that as a car guy or even if I wasn't a car guy, just a Gran Turismo fan, I would enjoy that. And it gives you some kind of structure to how you're going to tackle a very big game that does have many races to take on. All of this is made so goddamn pointless by what I mentioned during the intro, that by the fact that it's unvoice acted NPCs, which is a stupid stock picture that really does kill the entire quote unquote story. If you even do want to say a racing game has a story, if told with an interesting voice narrator, somebody that had a sweet radio presence, you know, and could be like the 1965 Mustang was ready to bang and swang the thang. 
bang. You'd be like, wow, this is sick. I'm learning so much. But instead, you're just reading a paragraph. After the, I don't know, 17th or 18th menu that you've gone through, you're going to be so sick of it, you're just going to start skipping through them. That's what I did. So as for the gameplay, and since this is a racing game, we're sure enough talking about the driving. It is very good. If you've played a Gran Turismo game, it is virtually identical to all the other Gran Turismo titles, except now this has an extra layer of immersion with the DualSense controller. We're talking about the adaptive triggers and the haptic feedback. That is the only real next generation feature here. Yes, the graphics look prettier than on the PS4, but there are certain scenes where not by much, you're going to see a lot of rough textures, sometimes around the shifters, sometimes the foliage off track, such as the grass and bushes are going to look a little bit blocky and flat. Sometimes if you pause and look real close in a vehicle, you might even see some jagged textures. But what's not going to let you down here is the DualSense controller. Honestly, I have to say this is probably one of the most enjoyable features of this game. Now, granted, you're not going to get this on the PS4. The adaptive triggers feel different in every single vehicle where the gas and brake pedal will have a different amount of resistance. And when you're under hard braking and you engage ABS or anti-lock brake system, you can actually feel the brake judder just like it would on the actual pedal. And that left trigger feels like an actual brake pedal, meaning I hardly ever squeezed it 100% because once I felt that good bit of resistance, I would squeeze a little bit further than that and not interrupt the balance of the vehicle when I'm entering the apex of the corner, not sway that suspension too much. It was awesome. You felt like you got a lot more feedback and it's definitely a lot more immersive. And the haptic feedback goes right in hand with that, Liter literally in hand. You're going to be feeling everything from the track in your hand. If you run off track, you're going to feel the crunch of gravel and sand in your hand. There is one very aggressive vibration effect, which is when you're on the highways in Tokyo and you run over these divots in the ground or these like separators in the road, I guess. It makes a thunky kerplunk in, in your hands. It is a aggressive vibration. But how much racing do you get to do for your $70 or 60 if you're on the PS4? A pretty fair amount. You're looking at about 333 races, which will take the average racer about 18 to 20 hours to complete. And you have 425 launch vehicles. That's without any DLC or anything. And over 90 tracks. Plus a lot of these tracks have a reverse mode or an alternate layout that changes some of the corners. So you're going to be busy for a while. And I will talk more on that when I get to the end game or replayability section of this video where I talk about multiplayer and some of the things you can do after you've completed those initial 333 races. Graphics. This is a mixed sack for me, but here's basically how I'm going to summarize it. The outside view of the cars look very good and generally the environments, the vistas off in the distance with mountains and the crowds looked really good, but sometimes the car interiors didn't look very good and also some of the foliage off track such as grass and bushes looked a little bit remastered PlayStation 3E or maybe maybe a launched PS4 title, but certainly not a PlayStation 5. That's not great. But when the ray tracing is engaged in the replays and then also the cutscenes and some of the vehicle previews inside of your garage, that's when the graphics look real goddamn good. That's why I said earlier during the intro that they should have a mode where you're only getting like a cap of 30 frames per second, but you have ray tracing on all the time so people can choose. Hey, I want the sheer graphical fidelity. I don't need the smoothest frame rate. So they have the option. Just give us options, yeah? Audio design. So not the soundtrack, not the music playing, but the sound of the cars and tires screeching and the wind rustling through the trees and whatnot. Incredibly good. I'm not going to spend too much time here because I don't have a fresh pair of pants in this room and I don't want to cream myself thinking about the sound of a Formula Un vehicle pinning out the corners at Redline. Oh, oh God, got me breathing heavy just thinking about it. But the audio design is fantastic. All the vehicles sound true to life. All the nature and environment sounds, a ambient sounds, if you will, everything sounds good. Uh, soundtrack. Oh, God. Some of the tracks are good. Some of the electronic and dubstep and rock are good, but they play a lot of funky ass, like 50s jazz what would thrown in with like a little hip hop beat behind it, and it's a little bit funky. And then they also throw in some really just silly shit that you're like weird. And Gran Turismo 7 also has this thing called music rally, which is a mode where instead of a countdown timer, you're just going to the BPM or the beats per minute of a song, and you can basically inevitably keep racing forever uh, to infinity and beyond as long as the songs are still playing because you're still driving fast enough. But a lot of the tracks are weird, so you're probably not going to indulge in that mode too much, I would assume, but we'll still add that to the in-game replayability that there is that mode as well. The soundtrack is fucking weird, to be 110% honest. Settings. There is a damn fine amount of settings, everything from graphics to audio to controller settings. And this game does have support for these driving wheels on screen here, and you can individually calibrate all these. 
So as for performance, starting on the PlayStation 5, you do have two graphical options. You do have one that uses ray tracing, but again, like I mentioned, that is not in races. That is only during replays, cinematics, and car previews inside of the garage. So you're still getting 4K 60 during the actual racing with ray tracing off. That is the mode that I would select. I believe it was IGN or GameSpot did mention during their review that they noticed a little bit of frame rate chug or hiccuping with that ray tracing mode on. I do believe that has been changed with a patch or update, or they were just smoking crystal meth because I didn't notice that at all. And then the performance performance mode is going to have ray tracing off. So if you are noticing any frame rate chug or hiccuping during replays or cinematics, you can go ahead and turn ray tracing off. And luckily for your PS4 players out there, the game is still getting 60 frames per second and it is not by any means ugly. It is not as beautiful as the PlayStation 5. Load times will take a bit longer and you won't have the DualSense controller. However, it's not a terrible experience. I played it on a PS4 Pro and it was pretty good. But even on the slim or base model PS4, you are getting 60 frames per second. You will see the frame rate taper back into the mid 50s. So 54, 56 range when there is a ton of cars on screen and a lot happening. However, that's pretty consistent. There is a bit more slowdown than we saw in GT Sport, but it still performs incredibly well. And along the lines of performance, I had zero crashes with this game and I do have about 46 hours in thus far. Did you say you had about 40 hours of gameplay time, but you said earlier that you can beat the game in about 18 to 20 hours? That is correct. So that leads us into our next section, which is in game or replayability. What do you do after you've beaten the main campaign or story? Or in this case, it's a racing game. So once you've completed all the base races, quite a few things. Like I mentioned, you do have that music mode, which is called Music Rally. I didn't really dick with that much at all because, again, the music's weird and the mode just didn't do anything for me. What I did do was go through all the licenses and get gold and everything because you do get an additional collectible vehicle if you get gold in all the licenses. You can also set up your own custom and private races, and there is a pretty damn sweet multiplayer. So you don't just have multiplayer handed to you, you have to unlock it. However, you probably will unlock it pretty quickly. And this game does have a couch co-op mode as well as two different kinds of multiplayer that you will see on the home world or world map. And when you take it online, you can either build your own custom matches or you can compete in ranked tournaments with a lot of other sweats out there that are playing with racing sim wheels and whatnot. So there's like casual online play, then there's ranked hardcore online play, and then there's couch co-op. So there's a lot of different things to do with multiplayer. And you can even sit in lobbies and chat about cars and go to little virtual car meets at these meeting places. And it's actually a great time. You can set up cruises and whatnot where you're literally cruising around with your boys nine deep with your custom Chevelles and Camaros or whatever, talking cars, listening to music, shooting the shit and whatnot. It's a lot of fun. And then of course you can try and collect all the vehicles, which some of the vehicles you have to get all gold trophies in a certain tournament or race. Some vehicles can only be unlocked at the license center. To my knowledge, there are no vehicles that you can only get from purchasing with real world money. However, I may be incorrect in that. The fact is there are microtransactions and I really don't like that because a lot of them are freakishly expensive. And the way that you get currency in this game is slow as dog shit. Shit. Uh, well, dog shit doesn't move at all, but if it did, it'd be slow. You unlock a very small amount of credits or currency every time you win a race, but then there's modifications. For example, a $100,000 nitrous oxide system, but that's just one example. They have some very overpriced parts and then the stupid little gambling wheel that they do. Either I am the most unlucky son of a bee in the world or the game's broken because I always got the smallest reward possible. If they had a stack that was literally a used condom, an apple core, and a couple used shoelaces, I would have won that. Every single time, they gave me, oh, here, here's a bag of skin dander. It was terrible. I could not win to save my life. So it all seems like it is pushing you towards going to spend real world currency, not to mention you do get pop-ups telling you to, hey, top off your currency. They shouldn't have that intrusive or aggressive of microtransactions. $40 cars that you can buy with real world money in a game that you spent $70 on. It does tickle me in the wrong jiddly bit and I don't like it. So verdict, is this game worth a buy? Well, uh, let's ask you a couple questions real quick. Are you a fan of the Gran Turismo series? No, then no, the game's not worth a buy. Yes, you are. Do you have a PlayStation 5? If you have a PlayStation 5 and you are a fan of the Gran Turismo series, I would say it is worth a buy, but no stepping into this game, all of the cons or shortcomings or areas of improvement that I have mentioned, some of which most likely will be fixed by Polyphony Digital as well as Sony Interactive Entertainment in the near future with patches and updates, but some of them are simply embedded into the game's code and can't really be changed. It would be a fat update, like a 20 gig update or something. So no, it's not a perfect game. So when you see these reviews, nine out of 10 and five out of five, two thumbs up your chocolate starfish. No, not 
not even to the knuckle, sweetheart. It, it, it's a seven. You know, like I said, it rhymes with Kevin. You didn't have to be uh, Leonardo da Vinci cracking the da Vinci code to figure out what, what I was rating the game. It's a seven out of 10, which is above average. It's a fun racing game, but it does have issues. Granted, a lot of them I'm sure will be fixed in the near future. I did get a lot of enjoyment from this game. I think a lot of my personal enjoyment came from the DualSense controller because it feels really immersive. And maybe the fact that I haven't played a Gran Turismo game since... I didn't really play much sport on the PS4. However, I did play a lot of GT6 on the PlayStation 3. This was kind of the kick in the nostalgia beads that I needed. And the thing is, it's going to take a very long time for this game to go down in price because, well, it's a first party Sony Interactive Entertainment title. And the only place you can buy a digital copy of a game is from the Sony store. That's been the way since 2018 when they made that change. So you can't buy digital codes anymore on like a little card and plug that into the PlayStation store. I I'm recommending it. I'm giving it a 7 out of 10 and a recommendation. And that's even putting my nostalgia on the back burner. As long as you own a PlayStation 5 and you have been a fan of the GT franchise or series, hey, it's worth a pickup. Speaking of pickups, they got some trucks in this game too. Whipping the dirt valleys in a baby blue tundra. If you enjoyed the video, liking it helps it to get seen by more gamers. This information will reach in a system as well, which in turn helps me grow this little channel, which I do greatly appreciate. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover news in the gaming community and industry, tutorials helping you get set up streaming and YouTubing, as well as honest gaming product reviews, keyboards, mice, headsets, controllers, mics, chairs, etc. There are some hefty exclusive discount codes found only in the description of my videos and only for the audience here at Gamer Heaven. Check out Into the AM for some of the sickest looking and most comfortable cloth to ever grace my gaming giblets. If you don't want to be scorching your corneas with harmful blue light, check out Gamer Advantage, the only blue light glasses on the market that look sexy and actually work. If you're looking for a custom controller that'll blow the competition's tits back, AIM definitively has the best bang for buck or price to performance when it comes to Xbox, PlayStation, and Switch controllers. Nope, they don't do Switch, but they do do games gaming mice. I said doo-doo. I have links to all my other platforms and socials in the description below. If you need a quick laugh or blast of gamer adrenaline, check my short form videos out at TikTok. Follow me at Facebook Gaming, where I am a partner and upload a ton of exclusive gameplay content. To get in touch with myself and the stallions and stallionettes of Gamer Heaven, join the community Discord. And check me out at Twitch.tv, where I go live every other leap year on a blue moon, if it falls into an odd calendar number, and my pH balance is on point. Just kidding. Starting June, I'm going to be live streaming a lot. Thanks for watching. This has been AK40 Kevin hosting Gamer Heaven, and I'll see you tomorrow because I upload daily, all the time, 60% of the time, sometimes, most of the time. Peace.